colleagues. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Ranking Member Lucas, and thank you to each member of the panel for being here today. I appreciate you sharing your experience and, and sharing with us this important discovery and, and how you went about it, and, and I, I think many of us are very excited to see what the next step is going to be. I would be remiss, however, if I didn't mention the contributions of the university in my home state, University of Arizona, um, where the uh, submillimeter telescope on Mount Graham was used, and coming up for the 2020 uh, series, there'll be the Kitt Peak Observatory will also be joining in. I'm excited about that. So, um, having made a commercial now for my own uh, state university, I, I'll, I'll now go to my questions. Uh, Dr. Dolman and Dr. Lonsdale, when the news broke that the first image of a black hole was going to be released, many of us thought it might be Sagittarius A, um, the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. What have been the challenges for imaging that black hole, and do you expect to be able to produce an image of that particular black hole? Uh, this, it's a wonderful question. Um, we have two primary targets in the Event Horizon Telescope project, both of which we, for both of which we can resolve that event horizon. Uh, we focused on M87 because the results started falling out very cleanly in a very pure way at the get-go. So we oriented all of the efforts of the collaboration towards that goal to get our first results out. But Sagittarius A star is next on our list. It, it is a little bit more difficult because during the course of one evening of observing, where we fill out the virtual lens uh, because the Earth rotates and changes our points of view of the object during the a night of observing, the source itself is changing because it is a, is a thousand times smaller in mass and therefore, it's a thousand times faster in evolution than M87. During one night of observing, M87 stays static, but Sagittarius A star evolves in front of our eyes, so to speak. Cool. So we're developing some new algorithms, uh, courtesy of Katie and the other early career scientists, uh, to handle that. Um, and I can speak a little bit to uh, the ways that we might be able to enhance the Event Horizon Telescope. And I'm sorry, thank you very much for the question. It is right on point for uh, some of the things that we're thinking about for the future. Um, one of the things that Dr. Dolman has already mentioned is adding additional telescopes to the array. And what this does is uh, create more points in front of that giant imaginary lens to collect information. Um, and as it turns out, uh, if you double the number of telescopes, you actually quadruple the amount of information that's available to reconstruct the images. So because uh, Sagittarius A star is uh, changing quickly, we need to gather a lot of information in a shorter amount of time so that it doesn't change too much. Uh, there's a couple of ways to do that. One is to add telescopes. Another, uh, which is perhaps a little further into the future, is to put uh, dishes into low Earth orbit uh, because those move much more quickly than the Earth rotates and uh, sample more data more quickly. So we've got a couple of ways to uh, improve the potential for imaging and making movies of Sagittarius A star. Great. I'm looking forward to that. Um, Dr. Bowman, what are other applications can come from the computational? You, you had kind of touched on this, but I want to know what other uh, applications you think might develop from com computational imaging tools that were developed to study black holes. Sure. If we're on the topic of Sagittarius A star and how it's evolving really quickly, yeah. where you have this huge amount of evolution over the course of the night, this causes ch challenges from us from an emerging perspective because the measurements that we take are taken over the course of a night. So each measurement is basically from a different snapshot of the black hole. And so we're coming up with ways of tying this information together to make not just pictures of black holes, but movies of it evolving over the course of a night. Yeah. And this kind of similar, uh, this kind of approach could be applied to many different problems. So for instance, one that has, I think, a very similar problem is in MRI when you're studying, uh, for instance, organs that are, are of, of moving or even like fetal MRI, um, um, taking images of a, of, of a baby inside of a, a mother's womb. Um, oh, and because as the MRI machine scans, the baby is moving, um, you actually also have to have, have a kind of a model of motion and understand that the picture is also evolving. So techniques that we use for imaging a black hole, similar ones could be applied to this idea of how, how do we image a baby inside of a mother to get a, a better diagnosis of, of, of issues that might happen. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I still have time. I'm going to zip through this question real quick. 
Um, this project is a great example of international collaboration in science. And questions are these. What makes a successful uh, uh, S&T International Cooperation Agreement, and how do we ensure these agreements are two-way streets, not the U.S. feeding its knowledge and talent to other countries without uh, uh, reciprocation? So whoever wants to take that, those two questions. Yeah, I'll start. So we have um, a lot of international collaborations on our various facilities. Uh, a great example is the ALMA telescope that played such a big role in this observation. Uh, also, we are contributors to uh, the Large Hadron Collider at the CERN um, in, uh, in Europe. And, um, and many, many of our biggest projects have international collaborators because the talent is worldwide and also they help with the funding, of course. And, uh, and so we, we have as principles for international collaboration that it has to be a win-win situation, as you said, Congressman. There, there, uh, er everybody has to gain from this. Everybody has to contribute uh, scientific uh, talent and, and get something from it. And, um, and, and it, the collaborations have to be to do something really important that's going to move uh, the discovery needle forward. Chef? It's, it's a great question. Uh, we, we wrestled with that, and we were successful because we adhered to some, some principles as we put together this collaboration. One was transparency. You have to make sure that you know what everybody is doing at all times. And we, we ensured that by making sure that all the working groups that we put together uh, had members from all the different constituencies. So everybody can see actively what's going on. We didn't sequester one group here to work on one thing or one group here to work on something else. We really combined everything through the miracle or burden of video conferencing. <laughs> we tend to live our lives on video cons these days. But it's really true that you can publish with someone now that you've never met. And it's kind of an uplifting way to think about things, right? I mean, we can really broaden the team uh, across borders and across cultures and across uh, different practices uh, in this way. And uh, we also had very strong policies on publication and how to proceed with allocation of resources and planning for the next uh, arrays and how we're going to go to the next generation. So by being very inclusive, we got the best of everyone and we also made sure that everyone saw what we were doing. And that is one of the principles that I think has made us successful. Thank you very much, Mr. Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, this is a question for, for anyone that's knowledge about, about it, but I was curious about the 